Hello, uh, I'm James Kirkup, Director of the Social Market Foundation. Uh, I'm delighted to be sitting down here with Gavin Williamson, Secretary of State for Education, to talk about that speech we've just heard on further education, forgotten education. Uh, I'm really pleased that the Secretary of State is here to talk about these subjects at the SMF. Uh, we're a cross-party think tank. Uh, we cover lots of different policy areas, but one of our abiding interests is in education, skills, training and jobs. And our real focus is on the half of the population that doesn't go to university. Uh, we sometimes say when we try to define our mission in life, it's to make the British economy more German. Uh, so lots of the things we've just heard from, uh, from you, Secretary of State, are extremely interesting to us at the, at the SMF. I'm very glad that you've, uh, you're here to talk about them uh, further. Thank you. Pleasure. And James, um, you know, it's, uh, I think the whole focus of making sure that uh, our whole education system is geared towards delivering the highest quality skills, the highest quality training, the highest quality education, actually to help people get into work, able to access the jobs and the opportunities that we want to see every child do. It's, it's got to be at the heart of uh, everything that this department does. I, I'd even say the heart of everything the government does as well. Now, you're talking about further education. I mean, Let's, this is about culture, isn't it? Britain has a cultural bias against further education, education doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, we've got some amazing further education colleges. You see what they do, uh, the skills and the opportunity they bring. But for far too long, uh, public policy has steered away from it. We've got to change that. Uh, we've got to make people understand there's 50%, uh, that forgotten 50% of young people who are just not being catered for to the highest level. There's not enough focus in terms of public policy. We've got to change that. And our further education colleges have got to be at the absolute heart of that change and delivering that change and delivering those opportunities. Before, just before we talk about government policy, just the, the actions that you, you are necessary. You, you talk about you know, addressing the cultural, you know, the cultural bias, I suppose. I mean, what, what do the actions that are necessary to address that bias look like for, say, employers? Um, because at the moment, again, you, we have a almost default assumption in lots of cases that top jobs, the important jobs, you know, the senior, senior management, you know, prominent, prominent positions will be, I mean, they just take the fact that they are currently dominated by graduates. Um, I mean, do you, does success here look like a country where people who don't go to university occupy more senior roles in business, the law, the media, all the sort of the commanding heights of the economy, is that? Well, what I, what I would like to say is not just within, uh, not just companies, not just within the private sector, but right across the public sector as well. Far too often we're barring people for going for those jobs as it's graduates only. Now, what we want to do is make sure that people have the right competency, uh, the right skills in order to be able to do those jobs to the best of their ability. But the routes as they get there, we shouldn't constantly be defining it as uh, solely through a degree. And um, you do want to see that cultural drive. You do want to see that cultural change. You are seeing it. You're seeing it in certain sectors of economy much more pro in a much more pronounced way. You know, in the manufacturing sector has traditionally always been so much better in terms of the service sector. But then when you look at the, the new emerging or the emerged titans of the new economy, the, the Googles, the, you know, the Bloombergs, you know, uh, as much in the digital sector and the service sector, the real recognition that they are doing themselves a disservice by trying to have too narrow a defined route of it's got to be graduates. And you're seeing an amazing push, especially in the digital sector, of how they tap into uh, you know, young people coming in through the apprenticeship route, how that they can add so much, uh, so much value. And that's not, a, uh, that's not to ignore the university sector, and the university sector will always play an absolute vital role for making sure they're not closing their minds to 50% of uh, uh, the young people who offer so much potential. And that's where we've got to be driving right, so that, that societal change. We, sh we shouldn't be nervous about uh, um, really pushing at the boundaries there. So it's not, obviously it's not in your gift how people advertise their jobs and how, how, how employers recruit, but it sounds like you, you think that uh, essentially anybody who is thinking about advertising for a job to say minimum requirement undergraduate degree or graduate, a graduate recruitment scheme, as a general rule, you're not really in favour of that 
approached recruitment? Well, I, I think the sort of private sector is so rapidly moving to the point where they just want the best. And that could be someone who's done uh, a brilliant degree that's been able to take them on the pathway uh, into that job. But equally, and, and just as importantly, it should be through apprenticeship routes, it should be through, uh, you know, the accumulation of uh, high quality um, you know, sort of a high quality learning, and that might be through colleges as it, mu uh, as it can be through, uh, through universities. But the key thing, as we sort of talk about a, a, a sort of a, a more Germanic uh, model, um, I'm often struck by how much we, we do. This isn't got a clear focus on what the end outcomes are. And I don't think that we should be nervous about talking about the fact that we're giving people the skills and the training and giving them the education so that they, they, when they leave school, college, university, they can comfortably and easily step off straight into a job. Because, you know, yes, success is, uh, yes, it's about the qualifications that you get, but it's what you, the real success, is what you then go on to achieve with your life. Uh, the real success is how you then go and use what you've learnt, whether at college or school or university, and uh, you know, use it to provide uh, for yourself and your family in the future. And we shouldn't be nervous about talking about our education system being the, the system that is able to create um, you know, the skills and the talent for, for industry, the public sector. Um, you know, it's got to be forefront of what we're doing. You know, um, if you, um, I don't know where, um, I, I'm not sure if you're an apprentice or whether you're a graduate, James. Um, um, did, did you do it? You know, a very, very established, uh, great, great university. Um, but you would have probably have felt that uh, maybe um, that was a, a little bit wasted if, as a result of it, uh, you hadn't been able to use that to uh, uh, open up the opportunities to get jobs and work in the future. And, and we shouldn't be nervous about talking about the value uh, of education to lead us into work and making sure it ties into work as much as possible. We've got, we've got to universities and I mean, obviously you, you, the, the big theme of your speech is 50% is, is here, 50% there. I mean, forgive me for saying, you, you don't sound like someone who's terribly uh, persuaded by the, the, the idea of targeting, well, a target of 50% of school leavers going to university. We've let public debate be so dominated uh, for literally decades with an obsession with uh, a, you know a 50 percent target what we need to be doing is obsessed with what are the outcomes for young people and that can be uh, that can be brilliantly delivered through colleges as it can be through universities um, and and sadly what we've seen over the last uh, um, over the last decades is 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 actually the number of people who are benefiting from learning, especially maybe later on in life. Uh, you know, there's been a decline in that. The number of people who are uh, accessing uh, training and skills and uh, and learning uh, in different ways, other than sort of a, the pure three-year bachelor's degree, people have moved away from that. And we've got to, uh, you know, I I always remember my mum uh, going into. Um, you know, she didn't go to uh, to university. She, you know, um, she, she did her A levels and um, and went into work. But the real pride that she felt about actually taking up learning, taking up education at a slightly later stage in life, um, we've got to be recognising that people's careers aren't just going to be a, a sort of a natural progression all with one company, all in one industry. They're going to be changing multiple times over. And we've got to gear our whole education sector to be able to adapt to that and actually giving people complementary skills that add to the combined knowledge that they've already accumulated, but making sure that they're constantly relevant. It, and it's much more difficult today than it probably has ever been in the past. But if we don't adapt to it, um, people are going to suffer by not having the right skills to be relevant in the workplace in the future. I, I do want to come on to that, that question of modular learning and adult education um, in, in a minute, but also you said you, you talked about it in the, in the past tense. You said it was. Is it, is it gone now? What I, want, what I want young people to do is to choose the course that is going to actually benefit them in terms of being in the position to be able 
uh, to realize their full potential. And that is, uh, you know, often, many times that will be going to university, but equally many times that will be doing apprenticeships, that's going to be doing, uh, you know, higher technical qualifications. Um, these are going to be the routes that we should be having a real open discussion uh, with uh, young people, with, with everyone who is recognizing that they need to be looking at developing skills as to what is the course uh, for them, what is the route for them. We shouldn't be you know, we shouldn't be driven by false targets. Uh, we should be looking at what is going to release that young person's potential. So, I mean, so if, if the 3% target is gone, it's a false target in your terms, um, you know, the, the output of that, in terms of how, what does this mean for the real world? This means, presumably, that in future we will see slightly fewer school leavers going to university and more of them, you hope, going on to apprenticeships and higher technical and... We know that there's real gaps in our economy in terms of certain skill sectors. Uh, we see both the college sector and the higher education sector with real skills and real ability to um, skill people up in these sort of job shortage areas. We shouldn't be nervous about having that conversation about how we work with these sectors to make sure that they're offering young people the, the qualifications and the skills that means that when they actually finish their courses, they're able to go into jobs. Now, that will mean certain elements of disruption to the patterns that we've got into in terms of thinking about necessarily three-year degrees, uh, maybe uh, looking about some of the patterns in terms of, um, you know... A move, a move to uh, credit accumula accumulation, uh, do mo 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 so. modular and, courses... And, and yeah. You know, and you know, high quality technical qualifications that can be offered through a number of different routes, but are going to be more directly skilling up those young people to go into work. And we should be seeing these as, um, you know, where we have seen economies really thrive, really actually driving the sort of productivity agenda. These are the sort of skill gaps that they've been so much more capable of filling, and um, and. We do, we have had some cultural hang-ups uh, in this country. Um, you know, we've got, um, and it's, there is different emphasis in different parts of the country. I know in, uh, where I live uh, in Wolverhampton, if you, if you talk to uh, a lot of young people, they, you know, they put as high a value on, uh, um, you know, an absolute sort of uh, gold, uh, golden apprenticeship with a company like Jaguar Land Rover or one of the big aerospace companies as they would do is going to university. Well, this, this, um, this is one thing I want to ask you about apprenticeships because, I mean, y y yes, the, yeah, and it, there's a lot of talk about the value of the good apprenticeships, um, the higher level apprenticeships with bigger employers. And actually, and this is something our research at sort of my foundation, it's, more, it's still slightly anecdotal. There is some evidence coming through um, that uh, what's happening is that as the, the wage premium that attaches to better apprenticeships is better recognised, you're starting to see those schemes are being pursued by, sought after, by better off kids and their families. Um, now, that's a, in one way, that's a measure of success. I mean, if people recognise apprenticeships are going to deliver a wage premium um, and they're going to target those schemes accordingly, that's good. It shows they're working. But um, it, there are consequences to that for social mobility, aren't there? because sometimes apprenticeships have been presented as a social mobility policy. They are something which will allow kids from low income backgrounds to get up the ladder. And if those schemes are being colonized, I mean, blunt, I mean an anecdote, I was talking not long ago to uh, a recruiter at one of the big professional services firms who they run a sort of genuine, the gold standard apprenticeship scheme. Um, and what they said was that we are now seeing the kids who would otherwise have come to us via a good university degree and join the graduate trainee scheme are coming along and they're joining as apprentices um, because they know they know this is a quicker route to where they want to get to and a cheaper one as well but what that does mean is every place on that scheme that's taken by someone who is from essentially the russell group pool or whatever it is is a place that's not going to someone from the non from the forgotten 50 percent in your terms so is that a, i mean how do you how do you deal with that tension well the key element of it is uh, driving the expansion and actually making more firms really understand about the value of apprenticeships and what that can bring them. Um, and, and actually, it shouldn't be seen as something that is, uh, you know, uh, 
in, in the Midlands, where you have a strong manufacturing tradition, uh, there's a very clearly defined sense of what apprenticeship looks like, how that can help people access employment. That's good, but we need to expand it vastly beyond uh, those sort of uh, traditional heartlands of apprenticeships. And that means that, you know, we need to be looking at how we grow the cake. Uh, uh, you know, so make, create, a, create, create a bigger cake as against, uh, uh, and sort of seeing that apprenticeships or university is clearly defined for uh, one group or another group. We've got to be, um, we've got to be in a position where, you know, I do not want to see certain groups of people thinking that apprenticeships is for them and university is not, or vice versa. We've got to be growing the full suite of options that people are able to choose. Now, if there are more, uh, more children looking at apprenticeships from a whole range of backgrounds, that's great. That's something that we want to see. Uh, but what we do want to drive is um, is the apprenticeship options to make sure, and you know, seeing what the Chancellor has said, the importance that we're putting on apprenticeships. Uh, you've seen the, the value. This isn't just something that is driven from the Department for Education. It's seen very much at the heart of policy in Downing Street at number 10 and number 11, because we see it as a great opportunity for social mobility. But we want to see the, the ability to drive that into more companies, into more organisations, as this is a real amazing route to drive talent and ability. But, you know, we do not want to be in a situation where we're saying apprenticeships are for, for some kids but not for others. We want them to be for everyone. I mean, this all sounds good. And, I mean, I run a think tank, so I like sitting around talking about these things in the abstract at the level of policy. But, I mean, there will be some people who are watching this, who are following it, who either are in their, their teens or uh, the parents of kids in their teens at school will be wondering, well, we, okay, that sounds good, great, what do I do? How does my life change? What action do I take if I want to seize the opportunities that you're all talking about here? Well, I, we've got to have this shift, but we've got to give people the means to have that shift. And that's why, you know, the introduction of T-levels, you know, you're seeing is rolled out from September. Uh, you're going to see, um, you know, three courses, you know, on digital, um, you know, education and child care and construction. But these are courses that actually have the same rigour, have the same standards as you see with A-levels and are worth the same, but also have the technical vocational elements in it. And the reason why they're, mark such an important shift. These aren't things that have been, you know, sat around in sort of academic isolation as we brought them together. It's been done with, you know, on the digital side, working with digital companies, digital employers to make sure that they're designed to make them relevant for the work that young people, when they finish them, they may want to go into them, have the opportunity to do work placements in terms of digital construction, education and childcare. So it actually takes them through that progression of actually not just learning, but into the workplace, or equally, if they want to do further training, further skills, further education, either in college or university, a brilliant pathway into that. So practical ways to give young people the opportunities we want them to have. Which, I mean, you're setting up what's probably my, my last question or the last thing I want to ask you about. When you, you, said, you said you you you're talking about further education has forgotten education. You diagnose the problem as being this is seen as something for other people's children. And I mean, you started to hint a little bit in your uh, in your speech a little uh, about your own children. You're, you raised them, so I will ask you. Um, you sound almost like a a parent who's sort of teetering on the brink of encouraging you know, the next generation of Williamsons to sort of don't 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 bother you with university darling why don't you try an apprenticeship instead is that um is, is that is that is that, a, is, that a, is that a dinner table conversation in the Williamson household your, your Yorkshire folk always like to make sure that they um you know uh, money is uh, very well spent and uh, the idea of earning and learning I I, I always think is rather appealing uh, admittedly um uh, two teenage daughters and uh, dad's telling them what to do doesn't always uh, doesn't always really they acknowledge your natural uh, authority at all times does doesn't always end well but you know I'd be incredibly like all dads uh, I'd be incredibly proud as to whatever my children um, uh, choose to do but you know I sit down with them I talk to them about actually the real options that can be offered in terms of if they go down an apprenticeship route how that can really work for them and I think that's much more of a conversation that a lot of parents are having. Whereas 
Um, you know, I think to myself when I was uh, at school, so so many of my friends, um, so many of the friends that I was at school with, were having those conversations about, you know, they wanted to, you know, get a good apprenticeship, go to college, you know, some of us uh, went off to university, but many of my friends went straight into work, ended up doing, you know, ended up doing HNCs and HNDs, and that's really worked for them. That's led them to real great success. But there's far too many conversations that are had with young people where it's seen as this binary sense of, uh, you know, you know, you've got to go to university. That's that's the only option for success, and, and, and that. And if you don't, you fail. Something. Yeah, and that's the wrong conversation to be having. And this is where, and this is where public discourse has forgotten about that of a fifty percent, and therefore you've seen, uh, you've not seen the focus in terms of uh, policy thinking, attention, and resource going to that over 50%, and that leaves our whole country weaker. But also, we're doing a massive injustice, an incredible injustice to that 50% of young people. Um, that actually, for one reason or another, uh, university doesn't work for them, and we've got to drive better options for them. And we shouldn't be, um, you know, we, we shouldn't be shy of pushing that right to the top of a policy agenda. And the thing that I think is so different, um, you know, because we've had these false targets of where we've just been pushing, 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 you know, young people go to university, go to university, go to university. And we've not had the honest conversation of what is it that's going to work for you? What is it that is going to be able to release your dreams and opportunities? And it could be a whole range of different things. And yes, it could be going to university. Yes, it could be going to college. Yes, it could be to going and getting that apprenticeship. And, you know, and what I think is so unusual uh, with things at the moment, you have, uh, you have a prime minister and you have a chancellor and you have an education secretary that are all completely on one of one mind that this has got to be part of our, the top part of our policy agenda. And we've got to deliver this fundamental reform in this area. And if we don't, we are just going to be repeating the same mistakes that this country has been making for the last 40 and 50 years. If we don't drive this change, you know, you'll be sat with another education secretary in 10 years' time and they'll, they'll come up with the same diagnosis of a problem and they'll say that they're going to act, but this is our time to act because the economy, economy is fundamentally changing so rapidly as a result of coronavirus. If we are to address the challenges of all those seats that we won for the first time uh, in 2019, you know, it isn't, we've got to look at different solutions to the problems that are so prevalent in so many of those seats. And it's, you know, it is that sense of mission and duty that I think will genuinely lead to major fundamental change um, that we c will, in 10 years' time, if you can be bothered to have a chat with me, uh, James, I would hope that we can point to these changes leading to structural, deep structural change in the way we view um, the opportunities we're providing young people and how that leads on to a whole host of other benefits in terms of societal change, uh, economic productivity change, but equally the life chances of that forgotten 50% um, that we've just not done enough for. I, I, I can't make any promises about where we'll all be in ten years' time, but I can guarantee that for as long as I'm at the, well, for as long as I'm at the Social Market Foundation, for as long as it exists, our door will be open to politicians who want to come along and talk about further technical vocational education, things we've been talking about today. So uh, I, you, the, the invitation stands to, to you and all of your colleagues in the House of Commons. So, uh, but for today, thank you very much, Gavin Williamson. Thank you for coming uh, to the Social Market Foundation in virtual form, at least. Um, uh, and thank you, everybody, for, for watching on whichever camera it is. Yeah. Thank you.